Okay, that looks like it's uh, it's stabilizing. So welcome everybody to the Doughty Street Chambers Holocaust Memorial Day 2022 online event. Um, my name is Adam Wagner and I'm a barrister at Doughty Street. Today's running order is that you will first see an interview between me and two extremely interesting people, Noemi Lopian and Derek Nyman, um, who they both tour Europe together, educating about the Holocaust, and both because of their family history, but they, their family history is certainly on different, um, from different perspectives, put it like that. I won't tell you any more because it's, you'll hear about it in the interview. And after the interview, Noemi and Derek have kindly agreed to answer your questions. Um, so please leave those in the chat box during the interview. After you know, you've heard from my two guests, um, you'll hear that you'll hear that they remember the Holocaust in part to keep the memories of the millions who died alive. But there's also another reason to try and learn from history and stop it repeating itself. So in that regard, before we end, I'm going to be showing you a new film or part of a new film by each other, the human rights communications charity, which I chair. And it features survivors of different genocides, including the Holocaust, but also which have happened since. But without further ado, I'm going to move on to Noemi and Derek. so much for coming on this podcast, Naomi and Derek. I wanted to ask first how you two met. I think that's one for Naomi. <laughs> I yeah. found Derek on Facebook. I found Derek on a site called Aish and uh, they spoke about Derek um, and as much really his identity was then already on the Aish site as being de described as the grandson of a Nazi and I flippantly put in the comments, I'd love to meet this gentleman and a mutual acquaintance of ours at Cambridge involved in Holocaust uh, education and commemoration put us in touch. Um, I'd thought about this liaison dangereuse or this liaison before, but um, I met two people of Nazi descent, but uh, didn't really click for various reasons so there was that to consider as well and Naomi for, for the people listening and watching what is it about your family background that made that a liaison dangerous and, and <laughs> as you described it well I'm the daughter of holocaust survivors um the background that you see on the screen is my dad's book the long night my dad was 17 in 1939 at the outbreak of war and had to go till was in hiding till in and out of hiding they were still lived in his small town in upper silesia in poland called zawierce um but on the 25th of march 1941 the night that he refused to go into 19 and he was uh, into hiding he was an old teenager by then 19 um the nazis came to the house um, and he tried to quickly hide in another flat um in a cupboard but um the cupboard wasn't uh, concealed and the nazis found him and they beat him out with clubs and uh, he was taken to his first labor camp of grunheide and my mother um i only found out far more recently she was a little french girl of 10 years old when she was um, imprisoned with her older sister, Helen, then 13, younger brother, Joey, nine, in Anmas at the French-Swiss border town to Geneva. And she was questioned at gunpoint, age 10, by the Gestapo. And Derek, tell us about your family background. Yeah, I wonder, Adam, if I, it might be useful if I just show you a, photo, a few photographs. Absolutely. It'd be a good time to do that. So I'll, I'll start by saying I didn't know anything about my grandfather's SS background until I was 50 years old. This was very much something that the family suppressed. The past was something that they, they didn't want to speak about. So I, I just discovered my grandfather by accident on the internet. I found his name it was related to a charge sheet for the Nuremberg trials and his name was there with crimes against humanity use of slave labor 
and that was the first I knew. And, and why, why were you looking, looking for his name? I mean, or were you looking for other things and came upon his name? I was actually looking for the street that he lived in because my father joined his sister in Scotland. He was, he was an economic migrant. He was an illegal e economic migrant. And the two of them kept things quiet until after my aunt died. And then my dad revealed that he actually spent the war living in Berlin. And my wife had a conference in Berlin. I, I decided to go along as well for, for a little holiday. I asked my dad for his address so that I could visit his house. And it was simply keying in the name of the street that brought up my grandfather. And, and, and was that a big shock for you? Well, it must have been. Absolutely, yeah, dreadful shock. But, um, but because, I'm a, because I'm a writer, because I'm a communicator, I felt that I had to tell this story about how I found out about my grandfather. He was a manager of slave labor. And, and how this story had been hidden and how his family felt about it. And, and finally, at the end, how I feel about it. Um, so I wrote, I wrote this book, A Nazi in the Family. I'll share a few pictures now because there's one quite huge difference between Noemi's story and my story. Noemi has virtually no pictures. The picture that's behind Noemi is the only picture of her father as a young man. My family had hundreds and hundreds because they were privileged Nazis. So let bear that in mind as we just zoom through just a few photographs. So my grandfather did a kind of classic, classic thing. He fought in the First World War. He was patriotic German. This is him and my grandmother in 1921 after they're married, raised a family, began to raise a family. This is them in Dortmund, Christmas 1928. No suggestion at that stage of what he was going to do next. But then I start to get these photographs. A stormtrooper parade through Dortmund before Hitler's come to power. And he's taking photographs of these parades. He joined the Nazi party in 1930. So by then, this was a communist city, he was a convinced Nazi to such an extent that he was a bank official, but in his spare time, he signed up as a Nazi party official. So this is him looking like Oliver Hardy, and he was supposed to go around people's houses and find out their political views. Things changed in 35. He lost his job for whatever reason, and thanks to old school connections, he was linked up with Heinrich Himmler's deputy in the SS, and he went to work for the SS. This is a photograph that he took on the exact location of the concentration camp visitor center at Dachau. Initially, he worked as an auditor, but then later on, he worked as a manager of the slave laborers. And by 1938, Christmas 1938, he was sent to Berlin. The family were living on a Nazi estate and he was going to Auschwitz, Dachau, Sachsenhausen, Buchenwald, all the concentration camps and making sure that the, the people who were in captivity were working for his industries. And is, is that your father in the, in the, in the photograph? Yeah, that's, that's my dad right at the front and then his siblings and then various relatives. And there's a dissonance throughout all these photographs of, of a family living in a, in a privileged area of Berlin while all this is taking place, while the concentration camps are working, while the center of Berlin is being bombed. You wouldn't believe looking at the photographs that there was a war on. And, and, and is, that, is that a Hitler youth outfit that you're, I guess that would be your uncle? Um, yes, tall, is, a taller boy. Yeah, yeah, Hitler Youth and my my aunt, a bit of a wardrobe <laughs> malfunction there, but but she was in the the girls' version of Hitler Youth. So they're they're steeped in Nazi culture, and yet at the same time, they're a loving a loving family. And this is my grandfather. My dad 
when I found out who his grand, who his father was, described him as a, as a very distant man. And I think it's clear that what he was doing in his day job, he kept very, very separate from his family life, as so many of them did. My wife and I went and followed the family trail um, just you know, while I was researching the book. And we went as the family went. At the, towards the end of the war, the family fled Berlin and made for the Alps. They stopped at Dachau for a few days. My dad told me a story, this is, this is a bit grim, of how they were housed in a barracks hut. And he could remember his, his mother and his father standing at the window and looking out over this building, low building with a tall chimney. And his mother said, you know what they're doing there? And his father said, no. And she said, well, they're killing them. They're killing the Jews and they're burning their bodies. And his father said, no, they wouldn't do that. And she said, of course they would. Can't you smell the flesh? And, 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 this, and these, the, these stories were, and, and photographs, were they kept from you before you discovered the, you know, the truth at the point when you were you know, sort of in middle age? Yes, they were. Yes, they were. So my aunt kept them hidden from the rest of the family, hidden from her siblings, hidden, hidden from, from us. My, my uncle had some incriminating negatives that he actually got from Berlin and, and he just tucked them away. He just didn't, didn't, didn't want to know about them. And yet he, and yet he kept them. Yeah, he kept them. It's yeah, interesting kept them. in itself. So, so, so let, let's get back to um, you two meeting. So Noemi, let's come back to the story of um, you reaching out to Derek. Um, what happened next? Um, Derek, do you want to say how what we did then? Yeah, I mean, I'll just I start by saying um, I, I was giving a talk in a, in a synagogue in, in North London. The talk that I'd been doing for two, three years. And at the end, Noemi came up to me. She'd been sitting at the back and said, I want us to talk together. That took courage, determination, imagination. And I didn't realise until only a few months ago just how difficult it was for her to do that. Noemi, do you want to talk about how that felt? So it was it was all instigated by me. Um, I wanted this union. I, I saw a lot of the positive sides. I checked with my mum as well. I asked for permission as a survivor. I couldn't check with my dad. Um, he passed away when I was 12. And um, I, I knew it would be good to speak from the different angles and speak about humanity, um, human characteristics with both our stories. But um, our first meeting was at King's Cross and uh, together with Derek's wife, and uh, we tried to discuss how we'd go about our talk. And when Sarah put up a picture of my father next to Derek's grandfather, intellectually that was fine but emotionally I couldn't handle it um, I felt I hadn't asked my father permission it felt very very close and um, I felt very very uncomfortable um, I also barely knew Sarah and Derek it was our first meeting after meeting Derek at the synagogue and I didn't want to be rude and I certainly didn't want them to be put off by me I am quite bombastic um, so I um, um, Sarah noticed that I went bright red, my throat, my face, and she said, you don't look very comfortable. And so I explained. So I realized that um, slowly, and I only confided recently to Derek, and that's a compliment to Derek and Sarah, because we have become friends since then, that even though intellectually I recognized the importance, emotionally I was lagging behind. Usually I'm the other way around. Um, in as much as that it felt uncomfortable and that we started, uh, I, I always call it climbing the bridge and meeting Derek in the middle. But I also have to say maybe Derek subconsciously saw me as the Jew as well, because at one of our talks, Derek, um, in Switzerland, you introduced me as the Orthodox Jewess and Derek thought he was doing me a kindness. And I felt, which I am, of course, 
but first and foremost i am a female um i don't carry the label orthodox jewess or anything on and i felt i was being othered when i was trying at a talk to show um our first and foremost human similarities and then of course every human being has differences so um it's been a big journey for ourselves this coming together and growing together um trusting one another with our differences not our outlooks because we share a lot of the same values is that right derek um and uh yes it's been quite a it's been a personal journey that i'm only just beginning to admit to derek and and to myself as well i think it's i think it's been important that we have been frank with each other right the way through because if we didn't have that frankness and we couldn't really properly trust each other. I mean, it's quite, it's quite a difficult thing to do culturally, but if you just, just, just go about these things with the best intentions and be as honest and as open as, as you can be, because that's what we're asking of, of the people that we speak to. We're asking them to, to look into their souls and, and and do what you can to to break down differences and and strengthen similarities and common ground so if we couldn't do it we couldn't legitimately expect anyone else to do it it's, it, it's been a wonderful process i have to say absolutely just to um situate this in time when when was your first meeting January 2019. Okay, so so a couple of years ago now. Um, Derek, yeah, can I just can, can, I, can, can I just oh sorry, we're in 22 now. <laughs> but the year the years go on three years ago. Um, so it's your anniversary of your dangerous liaison, I guess. Um, <laughs> Derek, can we just go back to your grandfather's story? Um, what what did, did he, you said that you found him on the Nuremberg trials? um records did he ever um account for what he'd done or was he held accountable i would say yes but mostly no so the records that were used at the nuremberg trial they, they were quite specific i mean the burden of proof was very very strong because here you have him doing the accounts for the ss in which he lists the loss of 8,000 workers due to the special action. And the word was Zonderaktion, and it's a Nazi euphemism for a massacre. So had that document been shared with the prosecution and the judge at his denazification, and they were very, they were very keen to say that this wasn't a trial, he would have been given a much much stiffer sentence as it was because they didn't have the opportunity to 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 share these kind of documents he was able to say probably with a great deal of training from nazi lawyers no, didn't know about this didn't know this was happening and so he he did three years in internment and he was at the end of that he was given a one-year sentence and because he'd already served three years he was released. So, so, he, so he was convicted of a crime at, at Nuremberg? He wasn't convicted at Nuremberg. Oh, he wasn't he, convicted at Nuremberg? No, the information at Nuremberg was used to convict and hang his superior offer, officer, a man yeah. called Oswald Paul. Yes, he was convicted at uh, a regional denazification of, of being the fourth grade of offender um yeah yeah so a very a very very minor conviction yeah although for, so he spent but he spent four years in internment for that he spent three years in internment. three years in internment and then a, so, so so the additional year was not it wasn't an additional year it was one year that was taken out from time already served yeah that's yeah. right yeah so so, so and do you feel and, I, and i'll come to how, how noemi feels about you know that but do you feel there's been a lot of um attention on you know how little was done cumulatively to hold 
Nazi commanders and, and collaborators to account for what they've done um, during the Holocaust. Do you feel, how, how do you feel about what, what happened to your, um, to your grandfather? And, 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 and totally bearing in mind that, you know, as you say, there's a difference between looking at the history of what happened and, and what you felt as a member of the family. I think there are several important things that I've that I've played with over the years. One is the, the family refusal to acknowledge what he'd done and the family desire and something that was shared by millions of, of Germans to, to just bury it. Um, and I, th I think it's clear from what my father said that, that he, he never his father never came to terms with what he'd done and what he'd been involved with. Um, he, he somehow just managed to skate over it, really. So I have a strong sense of, a, of an injustice to, to, to people like, like Noemi's father, people who had, who had done wrong and had no comeback. Um, and Noemi, when you have been you've been going on um to speak at events with derek you i mean, I mean the two of you were born um you, you the two of you were not involved in these events directly it's a family history issue how does it feel uh, in terms of your personal connection with each other um because on the one hand you are uh, unconnected to these events they happened um you know before you were born on the other hand you know, we are all um we are all subject to our family history there's nothing we can do about it and nobody chooses the family they're born into how do, how do you sort of reconcile all of that and all of those conflicting feelings well the accident of birth i think is a is a huge help to me first of all exactly that derek isn't responsible for his grandfather i'm barely responsible for my children um you know each each is each is to their own and i think it's wonderful um that derek having descended from his grandfather and and, and derek by his own admission says that his his late father was brainwashed and was anti-semitic to to the plural of the Jews, to a group of Jews, yet he would have a single Jewish friend. There was this sort of schizoid disparity. Um, I think our, our friendship is something that I grow from and learn from. And I always say that human beings from whatever race or creed, I believe that we're all prejudiced. And so I believe that we do need educating. And I know we are so because I know our our social media is so powerful on giving us our own echoes. They know that's how we're wired. Give us more of the same and more of the same that we press on like. So I think uh, we grow exponentially, not even doubly to have this exchange and to meet other people and to empower other people to to do the same you know we can dislike others we have to accept that we can even have the strong emotion of hate but we don't have to to hurt and 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 you as a barrister i want to say what really um bothers me is that uh, we were no longer part of uh, deemed as part of civilization not only by their anti-semitic descriptions but by the change of the law of the land so normally law gives every civilian a protection and no longer will we afford it that protection and so language changed and acts changed and everybody changed like you said you know the germans weren't put to trial if the germans would have put to trial germany wouldn't have been able to function post-war as a country because the majority were at it yet belonged to the socialist party maybe but they were all part, you know, there was a huge machinery that, that, that aided and abetted. It wouldn't have been possible without, for, what, for, for various reasons. Yeah. Um, so, and I think the other thing that I want to mention there with the law is that my mum, as a little girl of 10 on the train, knew to be scared of people in, in uniform, when normally a little girl of 10 would know that she was protected by people in uniform. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, my 
area of focus and this podcast area of focus is human rights and you know the the the, the origin of modern human rights is is through the taking away of people's humanity is exactly as he described that people were jews you know um, people who were gay uh, black people um you know anybody that the the nazis disabled. deemed to be and disabled were deemed to be subhuman were not um, treated in the law um, by law and by society as humans which allowed all manner of crimes to be done to them um i, I want to ask you about the the current significance um, and one thing I want to pick up on is the point you just made, Noemi, and which has come up also with what Derek's saying, um, and also just bringing in um, Philippe Sands' um, work, which I guess has a lot of significance to you both, because he's done quite sort of similar exercises of speaking to people who were direct perpetrators, the, the, the family of direct perpetrators against his, his family who were um, Holocaust survivors or, you know, or died in the Holocaust. But I want to ask you about what, how you, why you go to audiences. Um, and, you know, one thing that strikes, I've been thinking about recently, I was asked to, to review um, Getting Away With Murders, a, docu a new documentary which you may, may, may or may not have seen, directed by David Wilkinson. And it's, and it's all about why the vast majority of perpetrators in the Holocaust um, I either completely got away with it or almost got away with it, as in the case of, of Derek's grandfather, but also this, this psychological imperative to forget and put behind, particularly once the Cold War kicked in a few years after the Second World War ended, and all of a sudden the, the anti-communists were, you know, the, and the former Nazis were more important to the West than, than justice against the Nazis. But, the question I want to ask you is, it, when we talk about the Holocaust, we talk about it in quite simple moral terms, as in, you know, it was evil, it was wrong, um, there was a clear sort of perpetrators and victims, and yet it, the, the lesson of the post-Holocaust period seems to be that, 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 that you can be very sort of clean and clear about the moral lessons of, of, a, of, an, of a huge historical event, but actually getting justice is quite another thing um and and is that one of the motivations for you two going out there and and, and speaking in the way that you do um derek can i ask you that question very long question i'm sorry it was such a long no, question no. i think our emphasis is largely pre preventative if we're going into a school we will give children the simple message if you think something in society is wrong, then act while it is still safe to do so. Speak out against it. If there's bullying in your class, if somebody is being ostracized, this, this is a practical example for you to follow. Do what your conscience thinks is right. Because after all, that, that was, that's what any dictator relies on they rely on the, the bystanders doing nothing they rely on this herding the the majority towards acceptance so that that's really where our focus is not so much on justice or injustice um, meted out to the perpetrators but how we prevent ourselves getting into that situation in the first place and for us, it's become, it's become particularly important with uh, the rise of authoritarian regimes in Hungary, Poland, with the fragility of democracy in the United States. We've been speaking to, to various people in the United States now about just acting while you can still do so, while you still have the power to oppose the dissent into totalitarian states. And um, getting justice would have been wonderful at the time, or even for any perpetrator today who can be found to get justice, not by somebody like me bringing them, but like any perpetrator uh, who should um, be brought to justice. The judiciary systems 
not necessarily like at the time where we had to have the so-called Nazi hunters. Um, one had to do it oneself. Society was not interested. Um, that's interesting on its own. Uh, why were these people not um, tried? So why were not all the people tried? I can give you one very painful, true story. It pains me because my father didn't know, and he did know usually who the perpetrators were. His professor of psychiatry and neurology, I found out after publishing the book by a friend who helped me to dig, Professor Mikurai, she found out was a primitive Nazi and actually killed with, um, with toxins, uh, people who were psychiatrically ill. And um, this man post-war reinvented himself and stayed and got a professorship at the University of Munich. I was contacted in 2018 by a doctor, Andreas Waldmann, who was asked by his professor, he's a consultant, to do some digging about ex-Nazi doctors, and in particular, Professor Mikurai. Um, he found out a lot of things and, and sent me, actually, the documents. But you know what really I found very disturbing was that this man was pushed out from his job, Dr. Waldman. He was made redundant. Not only was he made redundant initially at the University of Munich, in his subsequent job as a psychiatrist and neurologist, he was made redundant again and had to find a new job. He is now no longer in touch with me. I just sent him an email and asked how he is. I know he's got a wife and young children. What I'm saying here with this story is that the hatred of Jews is not dead. It's not dead in Germany. It's not dead in Britain. It's not dead globally. It's the hate that spurs me on to talk about kindness, to talk about basic human values, humanity, what in the Yiddish language they call being a mensch, that we need educating on. And it's surprising whether it's an intellectual or a manual worker, we all need the same education. This goes on. I know that I, as a Jewess in Britain in 2018, pre the elections, felt very threatened by Corbyn. And I knew when I saw exchanges on Facebook, shows my age that I always quote Facebook, um, had exchanges where people were very sympathetic to Jews, in particular a group of journalists, but said different ones for various reasons. They will vote for Corbyn because they need it for their health, they need it for their education. The point that these people missed, and they're good people, was for people of Jewish faith, British citizens born to the Jewish faith, it affected their very existence. I no longer felt safe bringing my mother-in-law into a hospital and asking for a glass of water. She was 93 then. I was worried I might be called the nagging Jew because this language was allowed, this hateful language was allowed. And this is my reason for talking to students, to young people, to everybody who will hear us, be it the judiciary, be it doctors, be it manual workers, to talk about what happens when hate can go unchecked. This happened over 80 years ago. But ladies and gentlemen, human nature doesn't change. We are all capable of it, good and evil. Derek, I'm, I'm going to give you um, the, the last word. Um, and, and can, can I can I just ask can I ask you about um, right. your, since since you discovered what you discovered, you've written this book, you've travelled the world speaking with Noemi. Um, what has your view of human nature changed? I think I've become more. This is this is strange given the given the circumstances, but I, I've become more hopeful of of people coming together and and good people triumphing over bad. I think because because I've spoken to so many people who, and particularly children who or students who have this this zeal to do better things. Now I I grew up in 
in a time where racism and sexism was rife. And I can say to 15, 16 year olds, if you were black, if you were female, if you were Jewish, if you were Irish, at the age you are now, when I was your age, your life would have been so much worse because you had been subjected to so much prejudice. So in a sense, that has given me a, a drive towards keeping the momentum going of things like Black Lives Matter, of, of me, the Me Too movement, of, of movements that are not driven by governments or, or political organizations, but come from within society of people who want to do good things and want society to change and want the law to reflect a more open, kinder, tolerant society. So I, I remain positive. And I think that's one of the things that, that keeps Holocaust survivors going. We, I, I spoke to a Holocaust survivor just before Christmas. She's, she's 90 now. And she's been speaking about the Holocaust for the last 15 years. And there are hundreds like her. Unfortunately, the number is going down by the year. But, but they were driven, and they're still driven, to speak in the belief that this can do good. So. Um, so, let me just make sure that you can see me. Um, well, even if you can't, it doesn't really matter. Um, I, I'm opening the floor. We've, we're very um, fortunate to have Derek and Noemi here. Um, so I'm opening the, opening the floor to questions if people have those questions. Um, I, I, I thought I'd begin just by asking um, Noemi, um, today being Holocaust Memorial Day, what, what is your message for, for this Holocaust Memorial Day? What, what would you like to get across to the people who are here? Hello, first of all, thank you for listening to Derek and myself. I think the message is, is a universal one that Derek and I give, which is even though we live in modern times, human nature does not change then we were capable of good and evil. Today we're capable of good and evil. And so we are tomorrow. So we have to um, hear the stories in order to understand. And I think there's no better way to tell you about the Holocaust than with personal stories, because that really brings it home, the hurt and pain on both sides for very, very different reasons. And uh, as much as Derek is kind and says I'm courageous, I think he too is, is equally courageous to come out, as it were, and to speak about being the descendant um, of having a grandfather who is a Nazi, because it's unusual. Normally, we have our parents as heroes. So there's lots to think about. But also why I think the message is important is because the hatred of citizens born to Jewish faith or culture is not dead. Derek and I were in Derby on Monday, speaking to three school groups and one adult group. And uh, the school group compared Nazi Germany, the first one, the sixth form was asked a question about um, Israel and Palestine, making reference to Israel being uh, Nazi-like. And uh, in the second school, where it was year nine, uh, a girl chatted uh, throughout um, the session to another girl, giggling, laughing and eyeballing me the whole time. And it was Derek who came up afterwards and said to me, Noms, this girl is anti-Semitic. So it's not dead, it's here. It shows me that our talks are important um, to make people understand how your very existence is actually threatened by this behaviour because it never changes in language, it just gets worse rather than better. It's a long message. And, and, and 
Derek, there's a, a question that's come through um, from the audience. You, you presumably spend some time in schools. Um, Noemi was just talking about you going to schools. Do you think there are benefits to teaching human rights in schools? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, because it's the foundation of morality. It's the foundation of justice. I think it's an ab absolutely essential. And it gives young people the discipline, the discipline of understanding why something is put into practice. It gives them the, the foundation, the reasoning behind it. So I, I think it's essential. Noemi, um, there's a question from Eva Steiner. Um, should the fight against anti-Semitism today be separated from other forms of anti-racism action? Um, and if so, why or why not? Mm, it's a difficult, it's, it's difficult um, because it's yes or no sometimes, I think. And it's probably case dependent. Of course, anti-Semitism is a form of anti-racism and therefore it's, it's part of that. Um, so yes, it's the same, and yes, it's not the same. It's not very well answered. <laughs> Can I add something to that, Adam? Yeah. I, I read a book that was published last year by David Badil, and he makes a very cogent argument about anti-Semitism anti being a particularly insidious um, method of approach, and that I think if it wasn't separated from other forms of racism, then I think it would simply be slotted at the bottom of the pile, as, as David Badil argues very, very vociferously. Yeah, I guess, I, I mean, my experience is that, uh, and as a Jewish person as well, is that anti-Semitism is different to other forms of racism, um, but every form of racism is different to every other form because they always have their own particular features they can be unique to particular parts of the world they can be um, they can come and they can sort of ebb and flow in history you know who's at the bottom of the pile in a particular place or time and I suppose human rights um, from my perspective give us gives us a framework to identify the common features of not just racism, but dehumanization. I know we, we spoke about dehumanization in the in the interview, um, that they do have common features. There are common features, as you'll see in the film that I'm gonna show at the end, in, in different genocides have common features, um, but that's not to, to find common, common features, isn't to, um, isn't to dismiss the unique factors which, can, which only apply um, in particular places and time. Um, there's a question here from um, Jack Waring for Noemi, um, and first he, he wants to say he'd like he, he'd like to say that you've been truly inspiring to listen to today. Um, and his question is, what do you think is currently being used as a bastion of hatred against Jewish people? Um, that, what, what do you think about that? What what is being used? Are you asking me what sort of um, by bastion what uh, type of anti-Semitism is being used? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think, I think all so. of them. <laughs> I think sadly all of them, and I say that in my talks when I'm with Derek in the schools, and I say really how ludicrous this hate, but you know, it, it's it's intellectualized, but it's a form of emotion. It comes from hate. And, and you can see how ludicrous it is because I always say the far right made the Jews into vermin and nothing. And not only that, elevated themselves by being the pure, the Aryan race. And I always say, what does pure mean? It, we associate pureness with goodness. And so it was right for the time uh, when Nazism came to power. The morality was a country of morality, of religion and of culture. So the purity and goodness and high culture, it's almost in that, in that vein. And then you have the other extreme of, of the far left um, where, where the Jew is the capitalist and takes over the world and rules the world. And, um, and then you have jihadi extremist type where, where the Jewish person is part of the Western and, and also gets done. And then today it's, it's the existence of the state of Israel. And of course, Israel can be criticized and many Israelis do, but surely it's, it should be allowed to exist. And, and the other interesting thing is with Israel, like Derek now said, um, 
you know, what Trump is, is like, but people don't go up to Americans and start shouting at them because of Trump. Actually, on the contrary, they sympathize with Americans. So it's, it's really all, all forms and it comes from hate. And, and, and when you hate to such an extent, it's, <laughs> it's, it's difficult to change the mindset, isn't it? It's a, so that's it's, why. it's a very adaptable hate, um, anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. That's one of its features. Um, I just, I'm just i going to pass on a comment um, from Marissa Cohen, who's a colleague of mine at Doughty Street. I just wanted to pass on my thanks for giving this talk a stark reminder that the very worst of humanity is never far away. I also wanted to praise your courage for talking about these things that are so hard to talk about and which many still cannot. I hope that you will both continue to do and what, what, sorry, continue to do what you do as long as you feel able to do so. That's from Marissa Cohen. Um, and then and I, the, I think the final question we've got time for, um, which I'll start with Derek on, um, Holly McLeod says, as a trainee teacher, I feel it's important to teach and represent the Holocaust to the best of our abilities. How do you suggest we could best convey our knowledge of the Holocaust in the most impactful and successful way? So Derek, do you want to answer that? And then I'll finish with Noemi. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, I would say this but it's based on comments that have been submitted to organizers of conferences and, and meetings and that is to have somebody who has a personal connection to the holocaust and noemi and i attended a, a, a conference last week and the feedback from the students they were practically all saying the thing that we really valued was to hear from people who were involved I mean, we are not directly involved. We weren't there, but we are indirectly involved and we can bring forward the experience of our families. So in an ideal world, you use Holocaust survivors. They're dying out, of course, and, and it's people, it's the next generation. It's Noemi and I and others. Um, if Holly wants us to come to our school, Adam, please put her in touch with us and we'd be yeah, we'll, love to come. Well, well, Holly, you can find my email address on my Doughty Street um, profile um, and feel free to email me if you want to get in touch with Derek and Noemi. Noemi, do you want to just um, finish, us, finish us off with, with your answer to that question? Um, I think it's very doable. I speak about something called lay layering that you start young to teach about basics, which we often take for granted which is to be decent, like I said in, in the presentation that you heard before, to be a mensch. And, and with children, you can even speak about my mum's story. Um, I've been to primary schools year six. It's been very successful, particularly when the kids have been taught a little bit just about um, Germany and the war. They were very enthusiastic. And then you repeat it again in high school, year nine, and hopefully at A-levels. And, and in, always invite a conversation don't just talk at them, but allow them to ask and come back. And then it's truly enmeshed. But we do need to talk. Keep talking. Thank you so much. And, and, and we've had one last comment asking, again, how to get your details. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the chat my profile link, which you can find my email address in. But thank you so much, Derek and Noemi. Um, it's been a real privilege to talk to you both, both in the um, in the interview and afterwards. Thanks for taking the time. Um, we're just going to finish off. I'm going to show you 15 minutes or so, because so we'll run slightly over time. I won't be offended if people sign out when they when they um, when they've run out of their own time. But I'm going to show you some of a 30 minute film which has been launched by each other today. Um, I'll also leave a link in the um, chat box to watch the full film on YouTube, um, which is about um, it's about the Holocaust and it's about modern genocide as well. Um, and it's I had a part in making this film and um, the three people you'll see um, primarily are, are really extraordinary people. So I'm just going to um, run that now. As far as history is concerned, things don't change. A number of people went out and killed their fellow human beings. Most of the population were terrified. Despite all those horrors, despite the world saying never again, genocide has happened since. History can teach us so much, but 
we keep ignoring history lessons at our own peril all the time. I was born in 1935, when the Nazis were already four years in power. I was very sheltered. I've got a photograph, for example, when I was two, where I'm a normal, happy, scruffy two-year-old, because you could keep a two-year-old child indoors. I was blissfully unaware of what was going on outside. Almost immediately after the Nazis came to power, my father was sacked from his position as a judge. Aryan Germans were not allowed to employ Jews. The Nazis went about it in a very devious way. Uh, they were beurlaubt, which meant released on holiday. Uh, they, the Nazis, uh, operated in euphemisms. I was born and raised in rural Bosnia, so it was a really nice childhood. My family had lots of animals. We grew some crops. When I was old enough, I was herding animals in the fields around the village. I had two older brothers who were looking after me, so, you know, my childhood was pretty much idyllic. When I was a teenager, that was a couple of years after Tito, the former Yugoslav president, died, some media started using propaganda, employing propaganda to vilify one particular group uh, in former Yugoslavia, Albanians. After 1984, this propaganda became more vicious. I grew up in a very stable family environment. I went to school. I played football. I went to this primary school. I, I received a very, very harsh treatment from one of the teachers. She didn't uh, like Tutsis and, and therefore she uh, used that reason to really target me. I had started having trouble issues at school, becoming this uh, rebellion young child you know, not doing well at school. Then football all of a sudden became very important in my life. I started realizing that there was some big issues among, among Rwandans when I was about 13, 14. That's when my, my dad lost his job and then we, we had to move. The government of, of that time put in place those rules that uh, Hutus had more right to jobs and education and Tutsis had less. So from that moment, I started realizing we were among the unwanted uh, members of the, of the community. My father was often in hiding. Uh, of Bush Telegraph, the Jewish community got warning of, of uh, what was happening before it happened. They either hold in their homes, uh, which didn't give them any protection at all if the Gestapo were after them, or they um, ignored it. Most of the population were terrified. The Nazis dominated and terrorized very Early on, immediately, they took power. They started killing people. They completely perverted the legal profession, the teaching profession, the medical profession. In 1991, we started having some serious problems. Six months before my village was attacked, one person who used to work for the local education board was tasked by, this, by his political party, Serbian Democratic Party, to form 13 illegal police stations. At the same time, a lot of my Serb neighbours were given weapons, either by these guys or, or, or by the army that I used to serve some years earlier, and no one spoke about it. At the end of April 1992, they staged a coup 
our freedom of movement was severely restricted some weeks later just after three weeks later my village came under attack and then there was nowhere to go nowhere to run and when we were ordered to surrender or you know we congregated on the local football ground it was clear there was a plan a number of friends and, and, and family members uh, got arrested purely because they were Tutsis. Normal people, people who had no idea of what politics are, who had no interest in the politics, who, had, who were just there trying to, to, to make the, their living and uh, all of a sudden you had such, an, uh, had been arrested such, is in prison. It became normal to call a, a Tutsi a cockroach. I think we somehow accepted it. A number of people went out and killed their fellow human beings without actually realizing that they were killing the really human beings. They believed that they were cockroaches. I was a football, football fan of a club called Rayon Sport from the young age because my dad was, was a big fan of, of, of that club. I became a goalkeeper for the club. I went on to play for the club for a number of years and I also played for the national team. When the genocide started on the night of April 6th towards April 7th, I slept and was woken up by sounds of guns and, and bombs exploding uh, in, 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 in Kigali. And there were so many soldiers you know, around, around the neighborhood. They came into our house, kicking the door in, accusing us to have play a part in the killings of the president. Up till one of them, uh, I think, threw up one of these albums. The photos took his attention. Who are, who are these people? That's me and, and my teammates. Do you play for Real Sport? I said, yes. I know every Real Sport Players, how can you say you're a real sport player? Well, if you really a real sport fan, then take those pictures and look at look at the pictures. We started chatting. We sat on the sofa. That moment of him realizing who I was really changed the whole atmosphere there. They had come in into that house specifically to kill us. I came to England on the kinder transport in 1939. I can remember being very shocked at the huge size of the boat. I remember being frightened that the boat would sink. Too many people and too much luggage. Under fives. Think everything bad is caused by them. Which, on being uh, abandoned by my parents in a foreign country, I experienced it as my being so bad that my parents couldn't and didn't want me any longer. I ended up in the Amarska camp, the most notorious concentration camp in Bosnia. I started recognizing a lot of the guards. They were basically the locals. Some of them went to school with me and some of them were my teachers. And I think if they were complete strangers, what was going on would be easier to, to bear than knowing that you didn't do anything wrong. At the beginning, there was no food, for, I think, for four days. We were crammed inside one former locker room. There were maybe 500 of us in this room and you just couldn't sit on the floor. There was no space to sit on the floor. It was extremely humid, extremely hot. After two weeks, they began the process of interrogations. But I say interrogations, but it was really the process of torture. Physically, I was there for two and a half months, but every day was like a whole eternity because you just want to survive. You just want to live. You want to see your family again. 
During the genocide, I lost so many family members, including a young brother of mine, who was just seven years old at the time. We were forbidden to speak German from the moment we came to the Steads, the first foster family, which I thought was crazy. I remember asking my brother, why can't we just talk? And I remember him saying, uh, there are soldiers around. He said, they're English soldiers. If they hear you speaking German, they'll shoot you because they'll think you're a German. There were stories circulating about Alaska. So the world knew about this place, but sadly there was no interest to put pressure on the Serbs to end the violence that was going on inside. ITN and The Guardian, they arrived in Bosnia, it took them some days, and once in Bosnia, Karadzic, he played their host, trying to dissuade them from coming to the northwest, but they were persistent and they finally arrived in the region on the 5th of August 1992. So I guess they didn't know themselves if there were really camps in the, in the region. And unintentionally, they saved my life. They came to hunt for this story and inadvertently they forced the Serb authorities to close down the camp. The lessons of the Holocaust have not been learned. The fundamental lesson that all human beings are equal as human beings. We're a long way from accepting that. I'm only one person, I can't do anything about it anyway. I think that was probably the attitude of most people and still is today. We need a massive drive to raise awareness of the existence of human rights. I have seen and survived something that I feel no human being should ever be aware of. I feel that humanity can benefit from, from such stories in hope that they don't have to go through the same experiences. I just want to show you in five minutes more of this. There's another um, 20 or so that you can watch on the YouTube link that I posted in the chat. But just before we finish, I want to show you this. Um, a part about the a new photograph pho photo exhibition um, of Holocaust survivors, which you may have read about in the um, in the press. The Generations photographic exhibition photographs of uh, nearly 60 Holocaust survivors who are all based in the UK. So we coordinated uh, survivors to have their photos taken by fellows of the Royal Photographic Society. Uh, working with some of our sister organisations who work with Holocaust survivors around the UK. And the exhibition shows these survivors, some of them with family members, some of them with objects that are very dear to them, some in their own homes. Uh, and it's a celebration of the lives they've built in the United Kingdom. For me, this project was about memorial, about remembrance, not forgetting, but also showing the concept of hope, really. The experiences have been many varied, from hidden babies to sitters who survived the Holocaust through the goodwill of people around them, who survived pretty sticky situations, you know, war and conflict and degradation in concentration camps, and survived because of great luck and stoicism and endurance and perseverance. And I suppose that is a, a message about life, really. During the Second World War, the Holocaust was a thing that defined how we saw and visualized humanity going forward. And I think that it's a lesson that we need not forget. The title Generations has multiple meanings. It recalls the generations who were lost, lost because they were murdered and the survivors who are celebrated in this exhibition, almost all of them had no relatives left when they arrived in Britain and they rebuilt their lives here. Many of them have gone on to 
build families here and for many of the photographs you'll see generations within the one photograph. The survivor with their partner, with their children, with their grandchildren, some of them with great-grandchildren. So it celebrates the families that they've built as well as the members of the families who were murdered. Of course not everybody was able to rebuild families uh, and some survivors chose not to have family members in their photos. So as we look at the photographs we think about the absences, who's not in these photos, and we celebrate the people who are in the photos. It's so important that we pass on that legacy because the generation of Holocaust survivors themselves are passing away, and the responsibility for sharing their stories and their experiences shouldn't only rest with their own direct descendants. We all have a responsibility. So thank you to everyone for joining. Sorry, sorry we ran slightly over time. Um, Holocaust Memorial there's a Day, lot in, the, um, in that us. film also about the rest of the Imperial War Museum Holocaust exhibition, which is completely new and it's extraordinary and it's really something worth going to. Um, so thank you again to Noemi and Derek who are still with us. Um, thank you to Raymonda who you can't see, but um, she's helped with the administration of this event. And um, I hope to see you again, all again soon. And if you want to, if you want to um, share the the interview with Derek and Noemi, it's on the Better Human podcast um, YouTube page, and we'll also go up as an audio file um, this afternoon too. So that's the Better Human podcast. You can find it wherever you find your podcast. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.